Welcome to Airway Breathing Conversation, hosted and presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan. This podcast was created with the goal of providing individuals of all levels of medical knowledge with anesthesiology related healthcare information. On this inaugural two part episode, we introduce you to the University of Saskatchewan Anesthesiology Residency Program. We speak with multiple residents, including Year 3 Dr. Alex Pellerin, Year 2 Drs. Kim Mayfield and Anne Marie Friesen, and Year 1 Dr. Sebastian Turcott, as well as one of our incredible staff members, Dr. Henry B., about the many perks of our program here in Saskatoon. With CARM's interviews right around the corner, we'd love to give all you fourth year medical students the chance to hear directly from us about what makes our program great before you make those ever important CARM's ranking decisions. Please note that while this podcast is run by healthcare professionals, it is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing beats care that is individualized to your own unique medical needs. So if you have any questions about content covered in this podcast that relates to your own health, please speak with your doctor today. Now, whether you are an anesthesiologist, resident, medical student, or member of the general public, come take a break with our host, Anesthesia PGY3, Alex Pellerin, and a multitude of brilliant and insightful guests as we demystify the incredible specialty that is anesthesiology one episode at a time. Uh, so I'm Alex Pellerin. I'm a PGY3, or what that means is a third year uh, resident physician at the University of Saskatchewan in the um, anesthesiology, perioperative medicine, and uh, pain medicine program. Um, and we are based out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, today, I'm joined by two other residents in our program, and we are going to talk about uh, the CARMS residency match. So this episode will be um, targeted at fourth year medical students and future residents who are thinking about uh, doing anesthesiology at the University of Saskatchewan. Perfect. So uh, I'm Seb Turcott. Uh, I'm born and raised in Saskatoon, and I did uh, most of my undergrad here in Saskatoon as well. Uh, completed med school here and then uh, was very happy to match uh, in my hometown as well. So uh, I'm a first year resident with the Department of Anesthesia here. And my name's Kim. I'm a PGY2 or second year resident. I'm originally from Edmonton and then did medical school in Calgary and was super excited to be offered a position here in Saskatoon. Noise, noise. Uh, awesome. Um, so maybe before we start, uh, we could all just recognize how stressful this year is for the fourth year medical students. I'm sure we all remember how difficult and stressful it was, like finishing applications and like prepping for interviews and stuff. Um, thank God it's over. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've run into a few fourth year students now and what I tell them at the time of this recording, they've already submitted their application letters and whatnot. And so I've told them the hard parts out of the way, honestly. Yeah. And now it's just about um, having fun with interviews and sort of picking where you could imagine, you know, your career might be starting off now uh, in residency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good tip is like, where do you see yourself? Like what program do you see yourself in or do you feel like you fit in too well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any other words of wisdom, Kim? I actually had applied broadly to three different disciplines. And at this point, wasn't sure where I could see myself. And it wasn't until much later on that I was really confident about where I wanted to be. So if you're not feeling like you know exactly what you want to do at this point, I think that's okay. That will come and you will figure it out. Mm -hmm. What time? Yeah, things just sort of seem to fall into place. I remember a lot of people telling me, oh, don't worry, it like works out the way it's supposed to. And I was like, those people are cruel. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about, but it. I think it actually does in the end. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're just going to run through um, some of the uh, frequently asked questions that were asked last year on Instagram. I don't know if you guys follow our Instagram account, but it's at USASC Anesthesia. There is a story section about frequently asked questions that you can revisit as well and learn about all sorts of stuff involved with our residency program. Um, but we'll just roll through uh, some of the questions that we had. So the first question was about um, different educational and teaching opportunities in our program. So some of the things that came to my mind were uh, we have academic half days every Friday um, and we have a full academic day once a month, right? 
That's great. Yeah, once a month. Um, and those are sessions that are led by uh, the second year and up residents. So in first year, you kind of get a nice break. You don't have to lead academic half day, uh, which is great. Uh, there's also lots of opportunities for clerk teaching. Um, so once you're in second year, you can help teach the clerks on Tuesday afternoons uh, when they do their anesthesia clerk teaching. Um, and there's also lots of medical interest group sessions as well. And I think, Seb, you went to one of them, didn't you? You went to the intubation one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. Yeah. Honestly, I thought that was a great opportunity just to teach others. But then also you start learning things yourself as well as you're teaching those sessions. So totally. um, I think it's always great to get involved in, in teaching because not only are you helping sort of some of the students below you, but then you're also getting something out of it yourself all the time. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would really agree. I uh, I taught um, one of the intubation sessions during the like clinical skills boot camp that the medical students do before um, clerkship. Mm -hmm. And I remember my colleague was like, you know what? You taught me lots of great stuff about <laughs> intubation. And I was like, that's because I did this other session before and other people taught me really great stuff about how to explain it to other people. So uh, definitely lots of good opportunities there. I think the other thing with teaching the academic half day is that you're working with a staff. So you're mm -hmm. well supported in... Um, what topics are like the highest yields or coming up with some resources to, fa to facilitate your teaching. So it's a well-supported teaching opportunity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one other comment I would make is that, you know, the staff and faculty here at the U of S are very open to teaching as well and gearing your learning towards um, what you want to learn on any given day. So um, I've had plenty of staff text me the night before an OR day and say, hey, what do you want to learn about? I'll sort of review it as well and then we can discuss it during the day. So um, I don't think learning opportunities are isolated to academic half day or, or our talk rounds as well. I mean, I find that the the department here has an awesome culture of teaching and, and has really um, benefited me as I sort of eased into residency over the last six months. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, our staff are very, very, um, very integral at that, uh, which is great. And then, yeah, I guess we should talk about talk rounds too. Yeah. Um, so talk rounds basically happen every Wednesday at 3.30. And it's where um, sometimes our program director or a senior resident or even a junior resident can um, go through a case uh, that they had um, and do it in an oral exam format. So yeah, lots of good learning there. I think the benefit of the talk rounds is that it's not only good learning for your clinical practice, which it definitely is, but it also prepares you throughout the program. We do some mock orals in preparation for our, our five oral exams. And so you get sort of comfortable with the format and, and the style of how to answer these questions and gain knowledge in that regard as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we were just talking about before uh, we started filming that Dr. B did an awesome job on Friday um, going through his his method of approaching uh, an oral exam question and how he um, helps a lot of the fifth years prepare for the oral exam. And I think that was so beneficial having that really early on. Like probably even as an R1, you're like, oh yeah, that's how we do those questions. Okay, I see I think it's great. And it's great that they include us in the mock orals, even if we just did one question because we're very new with it this year in, in, in R1. But just sort of getting into the mindset of how you would tackle these types of questions and, mm -hmm. and uh, present them uh, eventually at your oral exam in R5, I think starting it as early as possible is really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it does help with your like day to day clinical work as well. Cause then you, if you have an emergency case or you're on call, you're thinking, oh, yeah, these are the things that mm -hmm. I should be thinking about. And here are my considerations. Yeah. I think it allows you to think really quickly on your feet rather than having that time to prepare and read it. You have an approach to how you're going to go about managing a case. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Another question we get asked a lot about is whether or not we offer any fellowships in Saskatchewan, which we do not. Um, so what are, what do you guys think about not having any fellowships here? Do you think it's a benefit? I think for us as learners going through the five-year program, it's actually a huge benefit um, because you have access to all of the complicated cases that you might not have access to if there was someone doing a fellowship because they would be more interested in taking those cases. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a huge benefit that we get um, early introduction to some of these more complex cases and get continually exposed to those mm -hmm. kind of cases throughout the residency program. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, although we don't have fellowships here, uh, we still have fellowship trained anesthesiologists as well who have all that experience that they gain from their extra years of training. um, And they pass that along to us too. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's a great benefit as, you know, junior learners, we get in on these really complex cases with somebody who's um, has that extra bit of training and it, it goes a long way in our learning. And then I think it also offers a lot of different variety early on in your training and then allows you to sort of explore which areas of anesthesia you might be more interested in, Mm -hmm. in case you did want to tackle a fellowship after your five years of residency. So I don't think it's a disadvantage that we don't have fellowships here. There's still more than enough opportunities, I think, to get in on those really exciting cases. So. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. And um, and I think just like you mentioned, Seb, like we have so many um, fellowship trained anesthesiologists here, uh, which can offer you a lot of insight about where you can go and help with connections yep. about looking into fellowships in the future. Um, and, I, and we have like a, quite a wide variety. We have thoracic trained, regional trained, pediatric trained, critical care Um Vascular, yeah. So there's lots of uh, lots of um, staff to always help guide us in the future if people wanted to do a fellowship for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's talk about research opportunities. Um, so it's mandatory in uh, residency to complete a research or QI project. I guess now that's like a new thing with our our ones um, throughout residency, and we do have a clinician scientist, uh, Dr. Hedlin, who. Um, works on several projects and is always thinking of new ideas for projects. And then we have another physician, Dr. Gamble, who is also heavily involved in research and is always completing lots of research projects. Um, And I think what's really great uh, that we also have here is our provincial research coordinator for the Department of Anesthesiology. And she um, oversees, supports, and facilitates um, all research resident projects and also tracks them to keep us accountable, make sure that we're moving forward. I know she's definitely contacted me to be like, hey, what's up with your research? What are you doing? Uh, which is great. We all need that little push when we're like so busy doing everything else in residency. I think the extra little push that we get is in first year, we also take a research course that mm-hmm. kind of helps guide you. If you already have a topic in mind, it gives you something to force you to work towards your project. And then we also present our research projects at like journal club, or we have a research day for all of the residents where it's a invaluable opportunity to get feedback from staff about, well, have you considered this or have you thought about this? Or maybe you could try this or, you know, that sounds great. Maybe this will work better. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's a really great opportunity to get feedback on your research project. So I think there's tons of support and, and help to make sure your research project is a valuable one. Yeah. I think the department's very open to tailoring your research project to something that interests you as well. So mm-hmm. um, in speaking with a lot of my co-residents in R1, not a lot of us had an idea of what we wanted to do for a research project when we started residency, um, but just bouncing ideas off staff, like Kim mentioned, and then finding something that you're really interested or passionate about. And then, you know, Darcy and Jen, part of the research team here are very supportive and helping you develop those ideas a little bit further. And um, now something new as well this year during our, our journal club that we have once a month is we sort of just present sort of the skeleton of our idea and then get a lot of great feedback from staff. And sometimes it's it's a lot of feedback, but then once you, I know I got like a lot of amazing feedback from staff when I presented, felt like a little bit much at the time, but just unpacking it all afterwards really helped me sort of fine tune my idea a little bit. And I've been working with my supervisor on um cleaning it up as we're starting this research course. So Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really great that they just allow you to tailor it to what you're interested in because then you're more um, driven to complete the project as well during residency. Yes, absolutely. And then it's something that's doable because I think everybody has these like big ideas for what they want to do in their residency to complete, but maybe it's not quite feasible. Yeah. Right with sure. um, with your structure. And I think that's one really great thing about having those brainstorming mm-hmm. sessions during yep. Journal Club. Yep. Yeah. The other thing I wouldn't mind mentioning is that we have um, a statistician that helps us with what we're going to use for our statistical analysis for our research projects. So Mary Ellen Walker is who we work with, and she has been exceptionally kind and patient and helpful in determining how I can do my data analysis. Yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Hedlund also has a research assistant, which I am very thankful for because I don't know anything about research. I'm not, uh, didn't do it in my previous degrees. Yeah. So I really needed a lot of handholding. Mm-hmm. Still do. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a good point too. Not a lot of us have a lot of research experience <laughs> yeah. going into residency. And a question I get asked a lot is, you know, does that sort of hurt your application as you're going through CARMS? I don't, I don't think it does. Um, mm-hmm. But as long as you're driven or, or um, willing to work to, to complete a project and, and you want to work hard on it, then uh, I think that's all it really takes. So. Yeah. Do you think the other thing when you're applying for um, residency is that it's more important if you do do research to complete one project than to have five projects on the go, none of them completed, none of them presented, none of them published? Absolutely. Um, so if you're going to pick a research topic in order to use it to for your CARMS, um, that it's really important to pick sort of one project that you're going to do really well rather than getting onto five different projects and not really having a meaningful contribution. Yeah, absolutely. And now you can do a quality improvement project, right? Instead of a, yeah, it's still a research I thing, I think you right? actually have to do a quality improvement project in your first year. Has that yeah. changed? Um, no. So uh, yeah, that's sort of, it's part of the accreditation of our program that we also have to have some experience with uh, QI a little bit. So uh, Dr. Chaya runs our, our QI course. We meet about once a month or once every six weeks or so. Uh, just to discuss different topics in QI. And then we can either build our own little project on on the side just to demonstrate sort of our understanding of QI, or we can build it into our residency project. Project, okay. Um, And so for mine, it's sort of a hybrid between a research project and a QI project. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it sort of meets the criteria for both. So so there's lots of opportunities to sort of um, do it that way as well. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that's a new thing. I didn't have to do that. Yeah, it's changed a so, little bit since last year. Last year, we yeah. had to do a quality improvement project mm-hmm. within the RQIP course. Yeah. Um, but it was quite a small project. It certainly wasn't overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but now I like that you can integrate it into your research. Project. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Cool. Um, let's talk about the favorite part of the program. What is yours, Kim? Um. I actually really like that we have early exposure to everything. So we have a longitudinal program where um, you go to the different hospitals and you work in all of the different rooms all the time. Um, and so you get exposed to thoracics or car- uh, not necessarily cardiovascular till your second year, but um, different rooms like neuro suites and things like that. And you have exposure throughout your entire five years. So you can start sort of thinking about it as you're studying and reading. Yeah, Absolutely. What about you, Seb? Um, I'm a bit of homer, a bit of a homer for Saskatchewan, I guess. But <laughs> I love how small it is, and then the supportive environment that we get here. So um, you get to know all your staff right away. You know, I see different staff just even throughout the hospital, and they take time to to stop and chat with you, buy you a coffee from time to time. So they really try to get to know you as well. And then I think that that offers a very supportive learning environment as you're going through your five years of residency, because there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be OR days that go well and some that don't go so well. And I think developing those strong relationships that you have with staff and fellow residents as well, who are super supportive, um, it uh, it creates an awesome learning environment to make sure that you're you're succeeding during every step of the way during your uh, training. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I really like that about our program as well. It's a very, very um, supportive environment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's even when I was a more junior resident, you definitely had a lot of support from the senior residents. And I think that's still carried through, um, as well, which is really great. I feel like we have a really good mentorship aspect in our, um, program, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and I really like that we do longitudinal call um, cause I've heard from some other programs where you might not do obstetrics call for quite a while. Whereas in our program, if you're on RUH call, you'll be doing main OR, peds OR and obstetrics codes and traumas. So you always get that experience and exposure yep. instead of, um, being like, oh, it's been six months and I haven't done an epidural yet. A little bit nervous <laughs> to get back <laughs> into it, uh, which is really great. Yeah. Awesome. I think also um, I was really lucky. My year was the COVID year where we, everyone was pulled out of hospital. Um, but I was fortunate enough because I went to um, University of Calgary. I got to do an elective before we got pulled out for COVID. Mm-hmm. And I came here for an elective. And the feel of the program here is so amazing. Like the culture is just so great and positive. And I agree that the staff are so supportive and actually invested in your learning. And I felt that immediately in coming here for an elective. And that's what kind of drew me to this program. Mm -hmm. 
I think we live in, or sorry, we work in such like small facilities in general also. So there's not that many like specialist surgeons. The nursing staff are always the same that you work with. And in anesthesia, we work in such sort of a team environment that you really get to know everybody that you're working with also. So, you know, you see nurses all the time that you've worked with before and you develop a relationship with them. You work with different surgeons and residents in different surgery programs as well. And you really get to know them both on service as well as off service rotations that we work together with. And so then, you know, by the time you're through R1 or R2, you you sort of get to know everybody. And I think that's also um, not only for learning, but it offers a really great working environment as well. Yeah, I would completely agree. Yeah, as an R3 now, I feel like I know all the nurses, Mm -hmm. you know, I know all, you know, the vast majority of the surgeons and yeah, it definitely creates a way better working environment, especially when it's the middle of the night and you're coming in for an E1 or something like that, you know, that you can really rely on like your nurse, on the nursing staff that's working and they know you and Mm -hmm. know what you need. And yeah, it's very good. Nice. Awesome. Okay. Let's talk about living in Saskatchewan. Cause I think for out of province people, this is maybe one of the biggest hoops is I think they think like, why would I ever come to live there? Like what is really good about <laughs> Saskatchewan? And Seb and I are both from Saskatchewan. So we obviously have a bit of a bias. Yeah. So maybe Kim, you can tell us what you think about moving to Saskatchewan and how you've thought it has been. So I have to admit that I'm from Edmonton, which is a very similar city to uh, Saskatoon. Right. And similar weather, um, I guess. Similar right? weather. Yeah. Um, everybody says like, oh, Saskatoon is like a little Edmonton. And it is. You have access to anything you could want. There's great food. The restaurants here are phenomenal and really blew my mind compared to what I thought we would get. Um, I find the weather is not bad at all. It's no different than what I was used to. Um, And I think, again, it being a little bit of a smaller town, like everyone is just very friendly and very nice and very happy to sort of show you the ropes and, oh, you should go here and check out this. You should try this. We should do this. Um, I've had a very positive experience moving to Saskatoon. Awesome. That's really good to hear. Yeah, people are really nice here. We had a big Mm -hmm. snow dump just around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And the amount of people that I saw, you know, random people getting out of their cars on the road to help other people is a lot. Right. Yeah. Like people in Saskatchewan are very apt to help each other. Yeah. I went to the lake over the holidays and then I came back and my neighbor had uh, snow blowed my driveway oh, when amazing. there was like two feet of snow on there without even oh. me asking or anything. Like, yeah, the yeah. people here are super friendly. They're very neighborly because um, everybody knows one another almost to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. Like small it connections. A, yeah. Very small yeah. connections to yeah, everybody yeah. kind of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I let my bias be known about Saskatchewan. I love it here. I did live in Alberta for a couple of years after high school, so I have lived in different places, but I was very happy to come back. Um, And I mean, I would just tell people not to let the cold kind of scare them away. It's a little bit of a different type of cold, but the the summers here make it worth it. The summers here are exceptional and you always get really nice weather and really nice sunsets and things like that. And there's so much to do in the summertime here as well. Lots of different festivals and... um, uh, different like food events and stuff like that. So um, there's lots to do. The people are really nice. Yeah, I, got, yeah. I could go on and on, but I'll stop yeah. there. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> One of the other things that I didn't anticipate coming to Saskatoon is that we service such a broad area, and we right. get our catchment um, area is really our big. catchment area is huge, mm-hmm. and um, there are quite a few marginalized populations around the area. And so one thing that I didn't anticipate that has been really good for learning is seeing some of the um, conditions that you might not see in other cities because you're serving underserviced populations. Yes, I think that's a really good point. Um, I would kind of liken, we don't have as big of a catchment area as Manitoba, you know, as Winnipeg does for Manitoba. But when I did an elective there, I thought the the populations were very um, similar. And you just see a lot of pathology, which Mm -hmm. is obviously um, very unfortunate for the patients that we serve, but it allows us for this like big breadth of exposure to what we see. Like I've seen things in the ICU that you probably would never see in other cities, like fully disseminated tuberculosis, um, like affecting all organ systems. That's pretty rare um, outside of a developing nation. Uh, so those experiences are are definitely like very meaningful to our learning for sure. Yeah. Um, also, we have lake life here. I feel oh, like yeah. we should talk about lake life. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really experienced the lake life yet. Yeah, we're going to have to get I, you to experience that this, that this year, summer. Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there is more lakes than people, right, mm-hmm. in Saskatchewan. Um, 
And I would say for the people that like live here, going to the lake in the summer is a huge, huge thing. Because basically as soon as you pass Prince Albert and drive up north, the whole terrain of Saskatchewan totally changes. Yep. Yeah, like it's, it's um, what type of forest is it characterized as? That I don't know, actually. I don't know yeah. either. So we won't try to pretend <laughs> yeah. like we know what we're talking about. I just know from friends that have come from the interior of BC mm-hmm. to Saskatchewan, say that it reminds them of the interior yep. of BC as soon yep. as you come up to northern Saskatchewan. And I think that's a huge surprise uh, for people about like the vast different types of landscapes that we have. Like we have sand dunes, we have... Um, like obviously the regular flat prairie that everybody knows about with farmland. But then as soon as you go up north, like it's a totally different experience. Yeah. I think it's really funny when I started here, um, it was the summer. And so many people asked me like, oh, so you have a boat, right? Uh, or like they would be talking about their boats. And what I realized is that everyone in Saskatchewan owns a boat. I didn't, Or wants a boat. Or they may wants not own a boat, boat, but they want one. <laughs> but I would say most people own a boat. And I was quite yeah. surprised. And then I started learning about lake life. And yeah. And no, then a skidoo goals. in the winter. A skidoo in the winter. For lake life yes. in the winter too is becoming more popular. <laughs> nice fishing and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 And there's like a lot of, um, there's a lot of cross-country skiing Yes. Now, like totally. cross-country skiing trails and mm-hmm. like snowshoe trails, like things like that. Yeah. All the golf courses in town um, sort of create uh, cross-country ski trails so that you yes. can access them all for free, which yeah. is really awesome. You can rent skis. You can buy skis from lots of different places. I'm going to in actually town. interrupt there. Last year, you were not able to buy skis. Right. Um, so because shortage. then you could, but you yeah. wouldn't get them till the summertime. Yeah. So I think it's improved a little bit. I know <laughs> COVID, yeah. COVID, COVID shipping. Yeah, problems. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Supply and demand. Um, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's getting better. I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you don't have to go far either to in, like enjoy Lake yes. Life or anything. We did our faculty or our department barbecue at Pike Lake, which is just a small mm-hmm. lake, just about a half hour outside of town. Um, so if you want to make a day trip out of it, you can. If you want to do more of a weekend thing, there's lots of cabins to rent and different things like that. So lots of great ways to enjoy the summer, but also like you're saying, Kim, lots of uh, things to enjoy the winter as well. Yeah. And Alex, can you remind us where we did our um, resident wellness? We because went that was Elkridge. beautiful as yes. well. Mm-hmm. Also very beautiful. beautiful. Yes, that was also one of the things I thought we would talk about was just like different resident team building activities that we do. Um, But yeah, our wellness uh, retreat was awesome. Um, One of our uh, senior residents, um, Christine, did such a good job. And I think, is it Anne-Marie that's doing it this year? That's right. Um, And uh, yeah, it was so much fun. We had like structured and unstructured sessions. Um, There's pool there. There's the lake. There was like lots of good trails. Yeah, I tried to keep up with um, Allison App running. That didn't go very well for me because she's like a very, very good runner. Um, but yeah, it was super fun. I think we all had a great time just like hanging out because things were different during COVID yeah. and people just couldn't, um, because our residency program has such a family feel, um, people were just not able to get to know each other in the same way. Like when I started residency, we didn't do anything in person. Um, we even, when we came for our R1 boot camp, we like had to sit far away from each other and, and things like that. So yeah, things have really changed, thankfully, to get back to a feeling of normalcy, more mm-hmm. fun resident activities in the future, yeah, for think, sure. I think that's one of the first things we did together as a group. And I just had such a good time getting to know everyone and spending that time together. And we were in this very beautiful location. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, and it was dog friendly. It was dog friendly. So nice. lots of spread our dogs. I might, it might be the only one in the program that doesn't own a dog. Yeah. But, <laughs> or a cat. We have lots of cats in the great. program too. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, Well, why don't we just like roll into that? Let's talk about the different things that we do in residency for different team building activities. So obviously we just talked about the wellness tree. It was awesome. Um, Some of the sessions that we talked about were um, like financial planning. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a whole session about investing as well. I don't know anything about that stuff. So that was Mm. very informative to me. My husband was like, yes, these are things everyone should know. And I was like, "Mm, I don't know anything about (laughs) that. I'm with you on that one. I'm I'm slowly trying to learn the ropes. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know it at all. But one of the staff said, don't worry when you're a staff, I'll help you. (laughs) Thank goodness for those people. That he could see in my face like, I don't understand what they're talking about and Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. And he's like, don't worry, I'll set you up. (laughs) Yeah, love that. Love that. Well, it's hard to focus on something like that when you don't earn a paycheck for like 10 years. And then then finally you get into residency. You're like, wow, this is like earned income. This is amazing. It's not just loans. Yes. Awesome. (laughs) Yes. And then you're like, now I have to pay off those loans. Yeah, fair enough. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. 
um, yeah, for sure. So that was a really big thing. And then we had um, some structured sessions about just like wellness stuff in general and um, um, and also just transitioning to staff. I actually thought that that presentation was really good too about how to make the transition from a resident to a staff person. And I know lots of our senior residents really appreciated that one. Yeah. And then we just did all sorts of fun things together. It was really, really great. Um, yeah. Hung out in the cabins at night and yeah. Sat around the fire. Sat around the fire. Um, one of our um, residents who has children, she brought her kids. And I think we all had way too much fun in the pool <laughs> with her kids. Um, she was like, you don't have to play with them anymore. And we're like, no, no, no. <laughs> such a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is also um, great that, I mean, I don't know what other programs do, but it's, I think, really great that we really welcome like people's animals, people's kids, mm -hmm. like bring whoever, bring your spouse. Like everybody just wants to get to know everybody. Yep which is awesome. Um, another thing that we do um, is on the full academic days in the summer, we also have wellness activities planned at those times as well. Um, so what do, I was, unfortunately, couldn't make it because I was on call for the last one, but I think you guys went to the art gallery together? Go to the art gallery yeah, we did. and walk around. It was great. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Checking out different areas in Saskatoon that maybe we hadn't seen yet. You know, in the summer, we went to, was it Chief White Cap? Is that what it's called, the beach? Oh, um, Ferdale. Is mm -hmm. it called Ferdale? Yeah, it is yeah. called Chief White Cap, but yeah. Yeah, Ferdale Dog Beach. Yeah. Nice. That was another <laughs> Dogs can swim fun. in the river. Yeah. 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 That was a great activity as well. Nice. Yes, because uh, as we've already mentioned, many of our residents have dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we went out for ice theme. cream once. Yeah. Maybe. Yes, we did go to Fable. Fable. People also brought their dogs, yep. of course, to Fable because it was a nice outdoor activity. Yeah. There's so many different ice cream shops here. Like it's hard to <laughs> get all, get through all of them in the summertime almost. Yeah, yeah. it certainly happened. There yeah. seems to be a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fable's excellent. Homestead ice cream is really yeah. good. Yeah, we have actually, I do think kind of how you were talking before, Kim, about um, restaurants and stuff. There's so many good hidden gems yeah. here. And famous people, like famous people who judge things on the Food Network channel own restaurants in Saskatoon. Yeah. Uh, which is really, really cool. Well, I think we have like one of the highest restaurants per capita rating or something like yeah. that in the country. So yeah. there's more than enough like variety, whatever you're feeling on any given night, if you want to order in or, or go out for supper. So yeah, um, lots of things, lots of great brunch places too for post-call. Oh my gosh, so um, many good brunch places. Yeah. That so. all are available through Skip the Dishes. Yes. Because I know I often order the food before I leave the hospital. So by the time I get home, especially if I had, um, you know, like a tough night or I was like yeah. up, up the whole night, which is really common on our UH call, then I'll just like eat the brunch That's in amazing. bed by myself. Yep. This is a pro tip right here. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone's listening really carefully because <laughs> that was like a solid pro tip. We'll do a whole uh, episode maybe about like post-call pro tips and how like people manage themselves post-call. Someone yeah. taught me about the coffee before you go to sleep. So was, it, wake up was it Dr. Doing... Cowan? Because he is I think a big it was proponent. You oh, that maybe and I stole me, it from him. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. a game changer. Yeah, because then you wake up, no headache. Yeah, Boom. and you feel good. <laughs> and, and you don't sleep Unreal. for very long, but yeah. you're ready to go for the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, game changer. Huge, yeah, huge game. He's probably one of the most brilliant people <laughs> I know, um, which is one of our amazing staff members who trained in thoracic anesthesia, which is awesome. Um, yeah, for sure. And then we have lots of like informal get-togethers as well, probably like more within the um, specific cohorts like I know um, the R3s are all super close. We get together lots for yeah. drinks, dinner, hangout, whatever. Yeah. Um, do you guys find that in your cohorts as well? I don't think we do as much as you guys do. Um, yeah, we are but pretty we do, attached yes, as R3s. Yes, super good. <laughs> I think probably because we started in this awkward phase. I guess yes, you did same. as well. Yeah. Um, and now we have very differing stages of life in our group. You, yeah, you do. That's actually um, a really good point. So yeah. I think it's it's challenging for us to all get together because many of us are older and have families. Yeah. Um, but we do definitely try to. And then now we have these academic advisor meetings where we get together, mm -hmm. which I don't think we've talked about yet. But um, and that's been really lovely. Yeah, those are awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think for our group, because boot camp was in person again for us this year. So we have a we have two months of boot camp when we start residency and it's a mix of 
um, both in OR days as well as academic sessions here in the library. And so we got to see each other almost every day and get to know one another. And we'd have a different presenter come in and they would all ask, you know, what is one thing that we should know about you kind of thing. And so we all got tired of saying the same thing. So eventually we all came up with different things and really got to know one another just through that kind of just introducing nice. ourselves over That's and awesome. over every day. And so um, I think same thing, uh, residency is busy. And so obviously you can't get together every weekend or anything like that, but yeah. our group still um, stays pretty close and, and is always there to to support one another. So yeah, shout out to the R1s. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to the R1s. Yeah. And there's like very, um, there are people in our program that like specific things. Like we have quite a group of people that go rock climbing every week together um, in our program and are very, very into that, uh, which is awesome. I know quite a few of the R3s and, and um, Gemma and our shoot, we go to hot yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, together, which is really great. So there's lots of different like activities that we try to base things around. Um, and now there's a bit of a volleyball team that is starting with some of the staff. Really? Too. Oh, fun. Yeah. They should ask you, Seb. You're this whole <laughs> guy in our program. Yeah. <laughs> I've, heard, like, I've heard rumblings of like a basketball team. I could come play oh, volleyball yeah, too. There should yeah. Be, yeah, there should be that as well too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there's lots of good things like that that include like some staff some staff presence as well. Um, since you mentioned the academic advisors, let's talk about um, mentorship in our residency. Because I feel like the, our academic advisors are like a huge part of our mentorship now. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, so I can start by just saying when you first get accepted into this program, one of the first things will, that will happen is that you will be contacted by one of the residents that's a little bit more senior and they become your mentor and are there to answer any questions and help you transition, whether that's in your personal life and moving to a different city or whether that's getting used to um, your resident role. So where everyone's assigned a mentor right off the bat that you get to know. And then now we have two academic advisors that work with each year or cohort of residents. And we meet on a regular basis and check in and see how things are going and talk about anything we're concerned about or things that are going well. Mostly after that, it turns into a bit of a social event mm -hmm. and we just hang out and we're very lucky to have that. Nice. Like I, I saw on Instagram that the R1s went bowling. Our meetings with our academic advisors have been awesome. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, we went out for supper one night and then we did bowling. So we try to get together maybe every five to six months or so just to, again, just to check in, like Kim said. And then um, again, it just becomes more of a social event um, that's very supportive. And then we can just bounce ideas off one another. And it just gives us another opportunity because... Um, one of the challenges in anesthesia is that you work individually a lot. Um, and so you don't actually see your co-residents at, at work per se to mm -hmm. see how they're doing, to sort of see how you're progressing and, and bounce ideas off of them a lot. So it's nice to just have those opportunities um, to all get together and, you know, discuss both academic and non-academic things um, just to see how you're doing and, and to check in. Yeah, absolutely. And um, with I think all, basically all programs in anesthesiology have moved to a competency by design. So it's really helpful having the academic advisors to help you move through your EPAs and help you actually get the EPAs done that you need to get done, yep. um, which is really, really helpful because sometimes yep. you think, oh, I'm just, when am I going to do this EPA? And then um, somehow my academic advisors are send me a text and say, hey, I'm actually doing this room tomorrow. I think it'd be a good opportunity for you to get this EPA done. Yep. It's like perfect. Yeah. I don't even have to think about it. So I really appreciate it. Shout out to my academic advisors, uh, Dr. Lisa and Dr. Johnson. Amazing. <laughs> they do such a good job. Uh, yeah, awesome. And just like you were mentioning, Kim, um, we do have like a formal mentorship program as soon as you come into residency where you get like a junior. Did you get a junior and a senior resident? No, no, yeah, we did. Yeah. So yeah. you kind of get two people, two different stages to sort of help answer your questions. I know when I um, got my message from people I think that they maybe didn't realize I was from Saskatchewan. So asked me if I needed help moving <laughs> or settling in, which is so kind. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's not set in stone either. If you jive, you know, with someone else and you kind of just end up like asking them questions and that's, that's great too. But I know even up until like the end of R2, I was frequently asking my mentor like, Ooh, what should I do for this room? Or like, sh what should yeah. I do to count? Like, should I come in early? Should I set this up? What's this person like to work with? Um, so I just thought that that was really, really beneficial. 
Yeah, I had lots of questions about moving to the city because I didn't know the city at all. Right, I had actually yeah. been here once for an elective, but that was it. And I didn't see much of the city. So it was really nice. Yeah, they offered to help me move as well, which is very kind. So kind. Um, so yeah. kind. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, things to do during the summer while we were in boot camp and you have a little bit more time and just a little bit more of the social aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, should we talk about boot camp next? I feel like we've sort of um, danced around it, but I think it's one of the best parts about being in R1. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, boot camp was great. I think everybody in my cohort really enjoyed it. Uh, I already touched on the fact that we all got to know each other really well, mm -hmm. which was awesome. Uh, we got to learn some, uh, some skills, both sort of in the library and then practice those in the OR afterwards, which was great. Um, I think it's very underrated to be able to start residency and have a couple of months in the discipline that you match to rather than starting off service right away or um, just sort of getting thrown into the fire. Um, so it offered a great opportunity to sort of just ease into residency a little bit. There's no call during boot camp either, which is awesome. The so, best. I mean, I got to go up to the lake lots in the summer, go to different weddings, golf uh, outside of uh, sort of our didactic lectures, which was really great. And then um, there was also a lot of downtime where we would just sort of go for supper after a lecture in the afternoon or something like that, or just go hang out because we had a lot of uh, 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 spare time as well, which was great. So um, it, it's really an awesome way to start residency. Yeah. yeah. I think Absolutely. it also sets you up to be way more successful when you do start doing the clinical practice because mm -hmm. you spend so much time just learning exactly what it is you need to know to start. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what other programs do, but we didn't have a lot of lecture um, time in our um, med school to learn about what anesthesia is and what you need to know and how to mm -hmm. start. And so it really does kind of catch you up to the basics, yep. which was really beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because like some schools don't even have yeah. anesthesia. Right. Like they don't even have as a part of their core yeah. um, rotation. So, yeah, I think that was super, super beneficial. And it was great because you got to learn some of the skills or become familiar with some of the equipment mm -hmm. that maybe you've never even laid your hands on. Yeah. Like um, I know Dr. San Vicente does a really good job of teaching you how to do an epidural on a banana. Mm -hmm. Did you mm -hmm. guys do that as well? Yeah, we did do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and different skills like that, mm -hmm. which you would just never ever lay your hands on yeah. as, a, as a medical yeah. student, We right? did like a front of neck access afternoon just yeah. for what it's worth, which is really cool. On, on big um, tracheas? Uh, on the fake, yeah. no, not the pig ones, just the Dr. Kushinsky put oh, right, together she these. Yeah, she makes these like Amazing. Um, models, um, so which was awesome. We had um, sort of a PPE day where we learned how to put on our PPE properly. And there's probably a Very picture central. of us mm -hmm. on the on the Instagram now of that. Um, so lots of cool hands-on things too. It's not like we were just sitting and listening to lectures too. It's very hands-on and applicable to, to then practice it in the OR. And then you also get to learn sort of what the expectations are for an OR day as well and sort of ease into it that way so that right. um, later on in residency, you're, you're more comfortable with the flow of the day and um, and things like that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And yeah, like you said before, you get to do two days a week in the OR. So a really good way to just like ease you in. Because mm -hmm. um, I do feel that when you start, days in the OR are, are exhausting because you're just learning yeah. so much mm -hmm. stuff. You're learning yeah. how the room flows and how everything goes um, that you just might not have been exposed to before. So it's really nice to follow that up yeah. with like a day of being with your friends <laughs> yep. again. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> and having I think a it also gave us a really good early introduction to the pharmacology that's most commonly used. And yes. so we had a great opportunity to start thinking about the different drugs that we use and how they work and what your common dosages are. So that when you went into the UR, you were you were able to sort of draw up your morning meds and be ready for the day instead of being like, I don't I don't know I what know. to do. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what to draw. So it yeah. really sets you up to be more effective with that time. Yeah. Right. Do you guys still make your own med table? We did. Yeah, yep. that's what we did too in my yep. R1 bootcamp, which was so helpful because I think that's a lot of people's biggest fears. They're I like, still I don't refer know to these it. doses. Yes, I, I still, still refer use to it, it all as the an time. R3. Yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also had a day with Dr. Hedlund where he had completely disassembled yeah, an anesthetic machine. An anesthetic machine. And then you yeah. had to learn how to rebuild it yourself, which is actually, so I think, useful. knowledge that you need yeah. for your... Um, your royal college exam. So, yeah. you know, you learn it right off the hop. Which yeah, is awesome. and like the piss and diss and like, mm -hmm. yes, all these things yeah. that I definitely had no idea about before residency, how <laughs> yeah. important they are. Totally. Yeah, yeah, and make it making it fun mm -hmm. too, instead yeah. of just lecturing to you about it. Yeah, yeah which is really, really good. 
Um, another question that we get asked quite often is about our regional exposure. Um, so we do one block of um, city hospital per year, which is sort of our main regional site. Um, and when you're there, there's an opportunity for upper limb, lower limb blocks, and then blocks for breast surgery, including um, paravertebral, serratus anterior, and ESP, depending on whichever staff you're working with and what their... Um, whatever block that they're most comfortable with. And then outside of City Hospital, there's always opportunities for um, plain blocks like the rectus sheath, tap block, especially in gen surge, especially if you didn't anticipate opening um, a surgery. Those are um, great, great things to do. Um, and a new thing that's actually starting this upcoming year is that uh, we have POCUS time every month during the academic part of the year where we do like... Um, fast scans, echo, um, gastric content scanning to see if someone's fast or not, and then front of neck airway access, as well as different lung scans. And now part of that will also be scanning the um, simulated patients that come for regional uh, scans as well, which will be really good. Um, did you guys have an opportunity? I know, um, Seb, you've done one block at City. Did you get to see much for regional stuff yeah. while you were there? Actually, I got to do two blocks at City early on this year, which was great. Um, and uh, part of the advantages of a smaller program is that um, there's always opportunities to sort of sneak into a room that you that um, is open. And mm -hmm. so I got to do lots of different block rooms, got exposure to a lot of superior trunk and interscaling blocks um, in upper limb surgeries. Um, there was also uh, sort of more distal uh, upper limb surgeries where we were doing axillary blocks. So lots of different exposure to things. Um, and even if we weren't doing blocks, we have that block room at City Hospital. And so staff were always encouraging me just to uh, grab an ultrasound machine and just go scan your patient and Absolutely. pretend yeah. like yeah. if you were go through each block that you think you would do and just scan and just learn the anatomy a little bit. And I think that's a great way to start because um, unless you really get that good picture, you're not going to be able to perform the block very well. So it's a really good starting point that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. And scanning people for blocks is not really that invasive. And no. I find people, as long as you ask them and tell them what yeah. you're doing, patients are more than willing yeah. to have you scan them. Totally. Yeah. How about um, you, Kim? What was your experience at City Hospital? Um, yeah, I agree. We had an uh, opportunity to do quite a few blocks. Maybe I didn't have as much as Seb, but um, definitely I've done lots of blocks and I haven't done my city block for this year yet. So I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to that. Um, but it's a great opportunity. I love the block room. Um, one of the things that was really great is the staff that I was working with would always say like, why don't you, while I finish up in this room, you go scan your next patient. Yeah. And so you have lots of time. So it's not going to impede the flow of the room. There's no pressure to be really quick. Um, and you can just take your time and really scan for the anatomy. And I really appreciated having that so that you, I think sometimes in residency, you do feel pressure to not slow the room down, to not hold everyone up. And yes, absolutely. they were really good at accommodating so that you didn't feel that pressure. The staff feel will really advocate for your learning as well. That's so right. mm -hmm. um, they always say, you know, get out early, uh, go scan your patient and take your time. Don't rush. Yeah. You know, they always yeah. say it's, it's it's their job to manage the room and the flow of the room, but yeah. um, it doesn't sacrifice your learning either here, which is really great. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And once you're um, a more senior resident, you have the ability to schedule yourself in rooms. So the last time I did my uh, city block, I scheduled myself in the um, breast surgery room a ton because that's yeah. something I'd really like to include in my practice when I'm done is a is serratus anterior blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a really good opportunity to just do them over and over and over mm -hmm. again with the different staff that rotate uh, through that room to get like lots of different perspectives and tips, which was mm -hmm. great. And I have to say, um, our POCUS time is really valuable, mm -hmm. um, particularly with doing the bedside echoes. And Alex, you will remember, and I'm just drawing a blank on the name of the staff, the technician that comes oh, in. Oh, the and sonographer? Helps us. Marilyn? Marilyn. Yes. Marilyn, Marilyn is, is a sonographer that comes an in. Angel. And she is so phenomenal and so patient and so good at teaching us and teaching us tips and tricks about how to hold the probe, how to move the probe, how to angle the probe. Um and really get that experience on on some of our patients. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that really beneficial. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, I feel that we are very lucky here with our POCUS curriculum. Yeah. It's really good. Um, we have um, 
a lot of a lot of time. And then we also do a POCUS rotation as well. Once you're in your, you can, I guess, do it anytime between your third and fifth yeah. year or even in your, I don't know, could no, you I do think it in your third, year? third yeah. to fifth year? Yeah. Um, and it's a great block where you just do a ton of, ton of scanning. But then um, also these monthly sessions during the academic year are huge. And it's great because you have Marilyn, who is a sonographer, but also a staff anesthesiologist there because Marilyn is so wonderful at being able to explain how to get the scans and how to get really, really crisp images. Um, but then it's also great to have the other perspective from a staff saying, mm -hmm. actually, you mm -hmm. can only scan someone from the head, like from the head of the bed. So how are you going to do that mm -hmm. in the OR? Um, so that's also really, really beneficial. And I think one of the exciting new things that has happened here is the butterfly system and all yes. getting a login. So um, in our program, everyone gets a login for the butterfly system. We have two butterfly ultrasounds that we can take to use and practice on. So there's lots of opportunity to have access to the equipment for you to be able to practice if you're wanting to get more exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess you guys haven't, have we started POCUS yet? No, we have started POCUS yet for January. Is there a POCUS session in January? There would be, hey? I ha uh, I think so, because I think they did it last week. Nice. I, I wasn't in on that group, but... Right. Yeah. Oh, yes. And some people did leave academic day yeah. from Friday to go, which is also great. Awesome. Uh, really good. Okay. So um, maybe we'll talk about what uh, your schedule would look like in your first year. So the breakdown is sort of, um, you do four off-service rotations in first year. So you do one block of ENT, um, one block of um, CTU, uh, one block of, which is um, uh, medicine, trauma, and then obstetrics. You do two subspecialty blocks of anesthesia, which include out of OR anesthesia and obstetrical anesthesia. And then you do two blocks of general anesthesia during your boot camp sessions. Mm -hmm five general blocks of anesthesia other than that. And then there is room if needed for elective time or remediation. Um, but obviously, uh, lots of people don't, don't need that, but it is built in just in case. Um, from the rotations that you've done so far, have you found first year and like, how has everything gone with your off-service and your on-service rotations? So yeah, I mean, it's it's different for everybody because you get scheduled on-service and off-service a little bit differently. For me, I was, um, I had mostly anesthesia to start, actually, for the first six months or so of residency, which was great for me. I sort of got to ease into residency and sort of uh, train in the discipline that I matched to, which was great. Now I'm starting... Um, a few consecutive months of off-service rotations, which I think will be valuable in just learning some of the other aspects of medicine that we got to consider as anesthesiologists. Um, so um, it was really nice for me to get a couple blocks in a row of anesthesia off the start, um, just to build on each on each month and then get a little bit better. And I think, um, you know, we do these log books um, where we just sort of log the cases that we do every day. I think I got in like over a hundred spinals on my own um, and then sort of a mix of GAs versus regional cases and things like that. So nice. um, it was really just great to get a, a great approach to just sort of these general anesthesia blocks that we get. So, awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. You've been listening to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast hosted and presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan. We are very thankful to our guests for taking the time to share their wisdom with us this episode. We are also thankful to the Department of Anesthesia at the University of Saskatchewan for all their support in helping us to get this podcast off the ground. Finally, we have a huge thank you to say to all of you, our listeners, without whom this podcast simply wouldn't exist. We are thrilled to share our educational journey through anesthesiology with dedicated listeners like you and appreciate your continued support. Don't forget to follow us and our associated USASC Anesthesia accounts on social media. You can follow this podcast on Instagram at Airway Breathing Conversation, Twitter at Airway BC Podcast, or on any other major platform where podcasts are available. The video version of this podcast is available on the USASC Department of Anesthesiology's YouTube channel at USASC Anesthesia. You can also follow our department on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at anesthesia underscore department underscore USASC. Finally, be sure to follow the resident-run USASC Anesthesia account on Instagram at USASC Anesthesia. We'll see you next episode, but until then, stay calm, take a breath, and always remember your ABCs.